Would you believe that Intel's already launched high-end desktop, like a replacement high-end desktop? There's a higher-end processor than the i9, 13900K or KS, or 14900K or KS, depending on when you're watching this video. It's already out. Our story begins with liquid nitrogen, but we can have a quick segue about liquid nitrogen even before we get into it. Because I know that you're here for the ASRock W790 motherboard, but our story actually begins with this. This is the W3175X. This is a Skylake, Cascade Lake Generation Xeon from all the way back in 2018, although you couldn't actually buy it until almost 2020. It's a weird story, I know, okay. Let's take, take a look. All right, so this system is a system that I have been using continuously almost since I got it. This originally started as a system that was sent to me by some folks that I guess worked with the Chicago Board of Trade. And it started out as an Asus Dominus motherboard. And then I got to look into a, a case of the processor overclock where they were like super juicing their, their thing and like the edges of the CPU were curling because it was so overclocked. And then I had problems with the Dominus motherboard. And then I ended up buying another CPU later and I, I don't know, but I've, I've kept the system alive with dual 360 millimeter radiators. And this was originally very similar to the system that we saw on stage at Computex in 2019 that was being run with a chiller at 5 gigahertz. It's 28 cores. Mine's not 5 gigahertz. Two 360 millimeter radiators. I can manage 4.4, 4.5 before it really uh, starts to get super toasty. And it's that, that LGA socket, the giant six memory channel socket that was even beyond X299. There was a market for these absurdly high-end systems. There's a market for something even beyond X299, not just because X299 is long overdue for a replacement. This system in its current incarnation is with the EVGA Dark SR3 motherboard. I'm running a VROC RAID array because VROC, despite its licensing headaches, it's very low latency. With Intel Enterprise Class P4500 SSDs, this system will always be something special given EVGA and given what EVGA has been going through. Bottom line, this system with its 1600 watt power supply, its EVGA motherboard, and its unicorn processor is always going to be something special. Now my first introduction to W790 was actually at Computex in Taipei with world record holder overclockers. These are the people that make the systems go as fast as possible. And this is why I think that Intel has not put the best foot forward with this processor. It's actually not terrible. So there are a bunch of workstation class Xeons. People are buying workstation Xeon machines. That's nothing new, but for enthusiasts, uh, I don't know. They launched four X series Xeons, which was new this generation. There are two Xeons that are designed for quad channel memory configuration, and there are two that are designed for eight channel memory configuration. So you gotta understand the history of this a little bit for that to make sense though. So this, this system, this is a server socket, this LGA socket is many, many more pins than X299. At the very low end, you know, Intel would offer servers that actually use the desktop class CPU socket. And then there was X299, which was sort of their, their last generation server socket with some tweaks. And then at the high end, you could get workstation class parts that were not a lot different from their, their uh, server sockets. And so there was this, this wonderful spectrum of options from desktop socket, X299 socket, X299 socket with a little bit of extras, and then Skylake Cascade Lake generation socket, and then, you know, actual like fourth generation socket and Intel could get mileage out of, you know, their retiring sockets on the desktop generation. And that, that made sense. And that was a lot of fun, but competition and changes in the market and changes in the global macroeconomic situation, notwithstanding, um, some things sort of fell apart there. Like there's not really a direct successor to X299. So a lot of people believe, but this kind of is it, at least the four memory channel CPUs. So of the, all of the, the workstation Xeons that launched, there are four memory channel and eight memory channel CPUs, like I said, but there are also overclockable, the X series. There's two of them in this socket, the 24 core, which I took a look at previously in the Lee and Lee O11 dynamic, 
and then this one that I'm going to be taking a look at today in our W790WS motherboard. These motherboards have already seen liquid nitrogen. They will do the power delivery. They can do everything that you want to do. This is overkill if you just want a stock configuration workstation. But what I'm finding is these X-series CPUs, if you give them 500 watts, you will get breathtaking performance. 24 performance cores, I mean, think of it like, a, okay, a Golden Cove core is not, strictly speaking, exactly perfectly like a P core on a 13900K. The performance cores in these Xeons is actually way more power efficient. It's just that there's 24 of them, or 56 of them, or 32 of them, or whatever, depending on what SKU you get. And you can even get a CPU for this board that's about $300 street price. You gotta dig around to find a vendor selling you those, but that $300 CPU will light this platform, give you PCIe 5, and give you four error correcting DDR5 memory channels. I don't think six cores is enough for this, but you can get it done. The motherboard costs more than the processor. That's where we're at in 2023. Oh, and I almost forgot, up for testing is a crucial T700 Pro, this is a one terabyte Gen 5. Gen 5 SSD. For our case, I've chosen the Fractal Mesh Phi 2. This is a case that's gonna be all about the airflow. For cooling, I'm gonna try a tower cooler. We've got options from Noctua. We get the NHU9. This is LGA4677, so the Noctua model number is 4677. They actually have two of these that are compatible with 4U chassis, depending on if you've got a single or dual socket motherboard. The NHD9DX4677 4U and just the NHU9DX4677 is a little different tower configuration. This is a dual tower. This is a single tower with dual fans. Both of them are surprisingly effective. If you are not running an X-Series Xeon, either one of these will do the job for you, especially if you're in a 4U rack mount server configuration. For maximum tower cooling, however, there's the U14S DX4677. I've personally tested this cooler on the 56-core CPU, and it can handle TDPs up to about 480 watts, give or take. A little bit more if you have airflow in the system, but 450, 480 watts, something like that if you program that in. The CPU will turbo all day long, and you have a 450-watt, 24-core monster CPU that's just all performance cores. There's no efficiency cores, it's just all performance cores if you want to think of it that way. Now our motherboard bundle is pretty standard fare from ASRock. Got the removable Wi-Fi antenna, it's a higher end solution. Also in terms of other accessories in the box, they give you Velcro strips, two sets of SATA cables, M.2 mounting hardware, as well as CPU mounting gear. Did I mention liquid nitrogen on world records? Yeah. Yeah, you can do that. So me, with my own hands, I was sending a thousand watts of power through the CPU socket to the 16 core Xeon on this board. Also, ASRock does not mess around. Look at those fans. How many of the M.2 are PCIe 5? All four of them. You also got four PCIe Gen 5 slots. Now, when you look at the hardware compatibility list for this motherboard, you'll see that it supports 2400 and 3400 series Xeons. But understand that that's the distinction that I keep talking about between quad memory channel and eight memory channel. This is a quad memory channel board. You can use a 3400 series CPU in this. We will test that, but it's really designed for quad memory channel CPUs. If you're going to splurge for the 56 core monster, you really should buy a motherboard that supports the full eight memory channels. The 24 core CPUs, the 2400 series by the same token, won't use eight memory channels if you stick them in an eight memory channel board. As such, this is pretty much the perfect board for 2400 series Xeons. This platform is also made for people to know what they're doing, so there's not actually really a CPU retention mechanism. When I take this little plastic thing off of the motherboard, it is exposed pins. In case you're wondering where PCIe lanes went on consumer grade gear, they're here. Five slots. X16, X8, X16, X8, X8. With the second from the bottom being chipset lanes, I believe, they're at least PCIe Gen 4. In terms of I.O. connectors on this motherboard, there are two 8-pin connectors for the CPU plus an auxiliary 6-pin. We have the standard 24-pin power connector, and then at the front end of the motherboard, we have two more graphics input 8-pin connectors. This is if you're going to run a really heavily loaded configuration where you've got lots of 75-watt PCIe devices. That extra power is needed because it's the, the GPUs can use up to 75 watts from each slot not including what it would actually use from you know, the auxiliary graphics power connector. At the rear I.O. we have a BIOS flashback button that'll support future CPUs that are coming, hint, hint. 
antenna ports for our Wi-Fi 6E solution, two USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type A ports, and then we've got two 10 gigabit ports. These are provided by the Marvell AQC 113 CS. Then below that, we've got two USB 3.2 Gen 1 and two Thunderbolt 4 Type C ports. We've also got a 2.5 gig LAN with two USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type A ports below that. And then we've got our Realtek ALC897 audio codec based uh, microphone and then output and then optical SPDIF. Might have been nice to see 7.1 connectors here, but hey, it's a Realtek 897. If you need better than that, use USB audio because there's a lot of USB ports on this motherboard. And this is not actually the correct way to install the CPU. The correct way to install the CPU is to mount it to the heatsink and then put the whole thing together. And that's also why the motherboard comes with a couple of different CPU clip styles. It's for mating to your heatsink, depending on what kind of heatsink you have. But of course, Noctua takes better care of you than that, so you don't really have to do it that way. If you're gonna use a Noctua cooler, just put the CPU directly on the Noctua heatsink and you're good to go. Also in the Noctua box is this wrench, but you gotta be careful because this technically is a socket that you're supposed to use a torque wrench. So, this is not a torque wrench. You can get away with it, but how you know is because these little nuts are plastic and they will destroy themselves when you exceed the torque. That's kind of a safety mechanism. So what you do is you very slowly and carefully tighten with this and the resistance changes. You go corner to corner, opposite corners first, and the torque spike is extreme. So as you're going very slowly, it's like, oh, this is a constant resistance, constant resistance, constant resistance, and then it stops. Stop there. It's also interesting that this socket, even though it has 4,600 pins, uh, north of 4,600 pins, that you only have to have four screws instead of six, which is what we saw on our LGA 3647 socket that I was so heaping the praise on earlier. Now for our Noctua fans, anytime you're doing a Noctua push-pull configuration, you always want to use the slightly thicker rubber bumpers. And the reason for this is because it spaces the fan off of the cooling stack, the metal fins because you'll get too much turbulence and it'll make excessive noise. So always be sure that you do that. I've been guilty of not trying to dig out the little rubber bumpers in the past. It's worth the price of admission to just get the dual fan Noctua Tower coolers because they come pre-installed and you don't have to fiddle with it. A lot of the time I'm in a hurry. It's just like, ah, I just gotta get this put together so I can run some math. Most often it's easier to install your memory and your M.2 before you mount your motherboard. We're gonna go ahead and install our G-Skill Zeta R5 DDR5 RDIMs. Just a few years ago, these media companies were laughing at me and calling me names behind my back because I was asking for uh, error-correcting registered DIMMs and even soldering my own uh, U-DIMMs anyway, using my own hand-bend dies. And just a few short years later, look where we are! I was right! Anyway, G-Skill's doing a nice job putting these together. DDR5 6400 <laughs> registered error-correcting memory? Yeah. And these DIMMs, because they're, you know, registered error correcting memory, there are two channels on a DIMM. You actually have two ECC chips. There's two extra chips on every DIMM, not just one anymore. So, fun times. They're even more expensive, in other words. Now, while you can put eight DIMMs on this board, that's two DIMMs per channel, I don't recommend that. Although it is worth explicitly pointing out that this is a server platform and two DIMMs per channel is a lot more well supported than it is on desktop. The registered electronic design of this is more amenable to a dual DIMM per channel design than desktop memory. So you don't generally have the problems. And in fact, this has been a first class experience. The DDR5 experience, even at speeds like 6400, has been night and day better than the experience on the desktop platform. At some point I have to wonder if companies will just wake up and say, hey, the, the effort of qualifying and testing uh, you know, UDIMs is not worth it anymore. We're just going to put registered error correcting DIMMs up and down the stack. I, for one, would be fine with that, although there is a bit of a latency penalty in and in a, in a situation where we already would like even better memory latency. As always, Noctua puts a lot of thought into what they're doing, and even if you're running two DIMMs per channel, you can adjust the fan to give you whatever RAM clearance you desire. The heatsink has got plenty of clearance. Now, because this is a workstation class motherboard, uh, the standoffs are not in exactly normal positions on oh, our Fractal Meshify 2. The standoff peg that's in the middle to help you align the motherboard. I'm just going to move over to the rear edge. There's like a second hole rear edge. This motherboard's got the hole for it. And that's pretty much the only motherboard standoff that I need to add or relocate. There are extra motherboard standoffs in the box for other motherboard configurations. And every case is a little bit different. 
So double check the holes and double check the, the, the case standoffs because if you have a standoff somewhere that is not supposed to be for your motherboard, you can ruin your motherboard. Now, as this is a workstation and it's a little more work oriented, okay, you could get a lot of work done with a 4090 or a, you know, a gaming class graphics card, but I'm gonna add an RTX A6000 to this system. Uh, be sure to check out our guide that we did on the ultimate machine learning workstation on Windows if you're gonna use Windows and the Windows subsystem for Linux. Now, I hear you, Linux natively on this works pretty good. You can do that. But a lot of people just want to use Windows or are relegated to Windows. But we have this nifty Linux channel. You should go get subscribed there for content and everything else. And you can run this or whatever op operating system you want. You don't have to pay the Windows tax. But if you want to run Windows, uh, the Windows subsystem for Linux and have CUDA acceleration and all the Linux accoutrement, you totally can do that with our guide because it's actually pretty good. And you should check that out. Uh, the other nice thing about an RTX 6000 is that it's only two slots big and this doesn't actually block any slots you can use in your system. So even with this in the system, I'm still gonna have four usable PCIe slots, which is you know, just unheard of in this day and age. And that's because this is a two slot card. Uh, one other thing you might notice is our motherboard's a little oversized for our Meshify 2. Our, our rubber grommets are blocked. That's okay. I'm cool with that. We'll just come through that panel there or come down from the top with our cabling. It'll be fine. And there we are. Uh, the clearance between the, 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 the heatsink and the GPU, maybe not quite as much as I would like, but there we go. The system is booting and ready to go. I'm ready to add our PCI Express 5 SSD. I'm gonna do it in the front slot here. It's perfect, it's got plenty of airflow. And I'm also gonna use ASRock's active heatsink. Fancy way of saying it, it's a big old heatsink with a fan. And here we are many, 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 many hours later getting everything finally set up. We got our crystal disk mark results for our crucial T700 disk in place. The most important aspect of any kind of storage medium is the Q depth one and IO latency. I know I'm just, I'm beating a dead horse, but those are the most important things to me and why in the past, before Intel killed off Optane, more or less, I was so excited about Optane storages because the very, very low access latency and very low access time. Now Crucial has obviously done some really clever things under the hood with their architecture because in Crystal Disk Mark they achieve quite a good latency result. The number of microseconds here is class leading for NAND based devices. It is a little bit of an improvement over Gen 4 devices, but there's really not a huge difference, a uh, huge performance improvement I should say percentage wise for that IO latency. So the snappiness of how quickly something responds when you double click on something and it has to read something from disk, that's still gonna largely depend on how much memory you have available for caching and those kinds of things. When you're loading a level or loading in a bunch of data while you play games, that's where this is gonna make a big difference. So for the testing, the breakdown is about like you'd expect. Honestly, I was a little surprised that ASRock's workstation motherboard was as competitive as it was for power delivery and everything else. I mean, the X-Series Xeons are sort of odd from Intel, and the folks building Intel-based workstations, like a traditional HP or Dell-based workstation, you know, they're not all about the increased power consumption. And we've got these four X-Series CPUs that are just sitting here. At the same time, for PCIe 5 and having four PCIe 5 slots plus an X16 slot plus a DDR5 registered error correcting memory, you know, you can <laughs> you can put a terabyte of memory in this platform just about if you really want to. There's nothing else competitive in the market right now. I mean, maybe later on in the fall, but you can get a 16 core X series processor from Intel the 24 uh, 65X, it's overclockable, you can deliver 500 watts to it. That's the one that I was pouring liquid nitrogen on and it runs well. You can't build a better Windows workstation that has this much PCIe connectivity and support for more than 256 gigabytes of memory for this price point. For processors, your real choices are the 24 core, the 20 core, or the 16 core. I think those are the sweet spot. Well, you could do the six core if you just need the connectivity and the memory capacity. Overall, the build quality in this motherboard is very high. 14 layers of the highest end workstation components. 
there were a lot of little surprises along the way with all of those little details. If you do end up opting for a non-X Xeon CPU, I can't imagine that you would ever have any problems with this board because it's extreme overkill for any non-X series Xeon. And if you do pick up an X series Xeon, I really hope that you at least set the XMP profile and run your DDR5 registered error correcting memory at 6000 and beyond for whatever your memory supports. And you know, just, just goose your processor just a little bit. I mean, you don't have to be so conservative. It's gonna be pretty stable at the 350, 450 watt range as long as you keep it cool. And an Octro cooler will definitely do that. And that's the su surprising thing about X299 replacement stuff. Now, the landscape, the competitive landscape, may change later on in the fall, but at the time that I'm making this, you know, the end of July, 2023, this is a pretty compelling value. New platform, PCIe 5 all around, air, registered air correcting DDR5 at blistering speeds with the blistering memory transfers to go with it. From $300 to light the platform, I think, I think the 16 core at around $1,300 is the sweet spot, an even sweeter spot if the prices come down even a little bit more but the 20 or the 24 core could make sense for software development or any any real kind of like a Windows workstation use. Especially if you're you know sort of willing to DIY, you can get a pretty good value here. I'm Wendell, this has been a quick look at the ASRock W790WS. If you build a system with one of these or you have any questions or just, you wanna just show pictures of a thing that you did. It can be, you know, the cat tax, I don't know. Come hang out in the level one forums. I'm signing out and I'll see you there.